Today, we're gonna start with the guessing game. Guess who I'm describing? Stranger, alien. If you know the answer, don't say it. Soldier, because I went, I went over it with Christian. Witness, stewards, brothers, children, heirs, sheep, fellow citizens, branches in the vine, sons of the day, children of the promise, children of light, vessels for honor, the salt of the earth, lights in the world, sons of Abraham. Can you guess who this is? Pastor Jason. Pastor Jason. <laughs> Amen. That is one. But in more general setting, who, who, can, who can it be? Christians, yes. Sons of Abraham, sons of the kingdom, a royal priesthood, the elect, the called, the chosen, the righteous, the godly, the holy ones, beloved of God, children of God, still not done, people of God, member of God's household, members of the body of Christ, still not done, friends of Jesus Christ, ambassadors of Christ, followers of Christ, letters of Christ, did you catch that? Letters of Christ. Wow. Servants of Christ. Saints. Okay? You know now, right? Believers. Disciples. Christians. Christians. Yes. You guessed correctly. You got it right. It describes all of you. A Christian. I just went through three pages. Three pages. That was three pages long. A how the Bible right here that's in your hand describes who you are as a Christian just like multifaceted diamond that you might have or that your spouse might have every description I gave talks about a character blessing privilege of a Christian let this exhaustive list tremendous list that describes who you are encourage you empower you strengthen you throughout the week today we get to learn one more one more characteristic of a christian can you guess what that is overcomer overcomer with all that we went through last year and are going through this year overcomer is definitely a christian character that we need to learn we need to know and we must live with today's passage comes from first john chapter 5 1 through 5 turn with me there first john chapter 5 1 through 5 and the title is christian a true overcomer christian a true overcomer let's read one verse each can we all stand I'll read the odd verses and you can read the even verses. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of Him. By this we know that we love the children of God and we love God and obey His commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments and His commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Together, who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is the word of the Lord, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you so much that we get to worship you, praise you, glorify you, honor you and learn of one important character of a Christian life, of a Christian. God, teach us that we are an overcomer. Teach us how to live as an overcomer. Teach us this important life of faith that you've given us. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay. May be seated. So church, how can we live our life as an overcomer? Could the answer be love? That would be a great guess, right? as we've been learning about love for past few months. The ancient traditions tells us, I don't know if it's exactly true or not, but ancient traditions, you know, the old you know, Christian early fathers who write of this situation, the apostle John was nearing his death. He kept coming to the pulpit where I'm standing and preaching, little children love one another. 
little children love one another. As we can see in the book of First John, right, we see love one another, right? When the congregation grew a bit weary of this sentence, little children love one another, perhaps you feel this way today. Is Pastor, gonna, is Pastor Chan going to speak again on love one another? Maybe, right? And Apostle John, this is what he said. I say what I say because it is the Lord's command. And if this is all you do, it is enough. It is enough. We have been learning how love is so important in the moral test of a Christian life, right? The moral test. Are you truly living as a Christian? Do you love? Do you love your brother? Do you love your sister? Do you love the church? Do you love your family? Do you love non-believers? Do you love the world, right? Today, we learn another aspect that is of utmost importance. So we'll take a little break from love, but of course in the message there's gonna be thing about love too. But we're gonna learn another aspect that is just as important, maybe the one of the most important because it is the foundation of our Christian life. Foundation of our Christian life. What is that? Faith, faith. To become an overcomer, we must clearly understand the nature of our true Christian faith. So first and foremost, number one, what is the object of our faith? What is the object of our faith? Where do we place our faith in? What do we believe in? To whom do we put our trust in? Today's passage teaches us that the object of our faith is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Look at verse 1. Can we read it together? Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of Him. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ. Christian faith starts and ends with believing in Jesus as Christ. Jesus is the divine Christ, the Son of God. Jesus is the promised Messiah, the Savior of the world, who came to die and shed the blood for us. Christian faith believes in who Christ was prophesied to be, who he actually came to be, and how he lived perfectly as sinless man and God as written exactly in the Old Testament. Coming in the flesh, his teachings, his miracles, exorcisms, sufferings, Crucifixion, resurrection, bodily appearance, ascension, eternal mediator, glorification, and continual offering of forgiveness and call to faith. He calls you to faith, you and I, and everyone out there in the world to faith. For if you do not respond in faith, He will return, the Bible promises. He will return. But for those who have responded in faith, He comes to save you. But for those who did not respond in faith, He will return to judge you and not save you. This is who Jesus Christ was prophesied to be, lived to be, and will come to be. Only Christ and no one else. That was and is true of a Christian faith. Paul was so passionate on the object of our faith as he wrote in 1 Corinthians 3.11 For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Alright, continuing on. In 1 Timothy 2, 5 through 6 For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is a testimony given at the proper time. No one, no one can be saved apart from Christ. Any teaching that says one can be saved without Christ is absolutely unbiblical. In our church's evangelism explosion training, we talk about two types of faith that do not save you. What are they? Temporal, Temporal faith and? Mere, Mere head knowledge. Very good. Mere head knowledge. Believing that someone existed, right? You believe that George Washington existed. You believe that Abraham Lincoln existed. Do you have any relationship with them? No, 
It means absolutely nothing. Bible talks about this type of faith. James 2.19 You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do demons get to go to heaven? No. Mere temporal faith. What is it? Traveling faith. Financial faith. Children faith. Study faith. Work faith. Health faith. We pray for those. God answers those prayer maybe. And then what happens afterwards? Nothing. You walk away from it. None of these types of faith save you. True saving faith is what? Trusting in Jesus Christ alone. The object of our faith. Christ alone for eternal life. We meet a lot of people in the world that says they have faith. Some say, I have faith. I'm a believer. What I believe is in here. Have you met those type of people? What I believe, my faith is right here. I got it all figured out right in here. And they point at the heart. But they don't go to church. They don't go to church. They don't go and worship God. They don't go to Bible study. They don't engage in fellowship with other believers. Could she really be a Christian? Some say, I have some faith, but not as much. Or some might even say, I have a strong faith. And go on to talk about some kind of religious experience, right? Some kind of moment that he had with the Spirit. Or even some kind of experience in the past. I almost died, but God saved me. An angel came and did something for me. And gives meaning to his life. And he ties it and says, that's how I know God is real. And God has changed me and I am saved because of that kind of experience. Faith that Apostle John talks about is not this type of faith. It's very different. To John, it's not the experience of having faith. In John, verse 1, he doesn't write, everyone who believes in whatever or whoever has been born of God. He doesn't write that. What does he say in verse 1? Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ. Amen? Amen. That's what he writes. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. It doesn't say you've got to have some kind of tongue experience, some miraculous experience. You've got to be safe from a like, you know, car crash. Some kind of crazy thing happened to you in your life. You have to go through like 12 weeks of Bible study class to be baptized and go through all of this. No, that's not what the Bible says. John writes, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. Even in verse 5, John does not write. Look at verse 5. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes in belief? Does he write that? Who believes in belief, having some kind of experience, experiential faith of deep internal emotions and feelings? Is this something that happens inside you? All these feelings and like butterflies and some kind of emotion, right? He doesn't write that. It's not, who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes in some kind of belief? No, he doesn't write that. But he writes, except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. For John, true nature of Christian faith begins with the object of our faith. In this case, and the only case, absolutely the only way is in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, the Son of God. To be an overcomer in this world that we live in, we must believe in the true object of our faith, Jesus, the Son of God. An important question that we must ask at this point is, then where does our faith come from? Where does our faith come from, right? It's very important to understand. So the object of our faith is Jesus. Then where does our faith come from? Who is the author of our faith? You guys have amazing takoyaki and spam and rice. And when you guys had it, did you go, I wonder who made that? Did you guys have that thought today? I'm not sure. I think some kind of invisible figure in the back is just like, I just don't know who made it. Was that your thought? The second aspect of a true Christian faith that we must understand for us to live our Christian lives as an overcomer 
is to know the author of our faith. So who is the source of our faith? Some churches, some churches, some denominations would say us. The faith came from us. However, that is not what our church teaches. That is not actually what the Bible teaches. The word of God is very clear. And how any Christian church can teach otherwise is mind-boggling. Faith is God birth. Faith comes from God. Just as the lunch you ate today came from someone, it came from someone who made the lunch, God had to send faith. God is the author and the source of our faith. Going back to verse 1 again. We're still in verse 1. All right, stay with me. Everyone who believes that Jesus is a Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of Him. Which comes first? Birth of a child or your child's first smile, cry, his word, and his walking? Which comes first? Of course, birth of a child. A child is born before any of his actions are taken place in the world. He cannot walk without being born. He cannot talk without being born. He cannot cry. He cannot yell. He cannot utter a single word without being born. Similarly, a spiritual birth comes before belief, one's faith. God has to make you miraculously and spiritually born again. In this Christian world, we call this regeneration. Us being born again in God. Regeneration. So we're teaching you another word. We taught you a couple weeks ago the word propitiation, a Christian word. We are teaching you this word regeneration. This is kind of hard, but let me help you understand in a very simple term. The miraculous work of God took place before we can believe in the object of our faith. So for us to have faith, we must be given faith from the author of faith, who is God. Believes in verse 1. Right? If you look at the word believes in verse 1, it's present tense in the original Greek word. Present tense meaning it's a continual believing. You keep believing. On the other hand, if you look at the word has been born, it's a, in the perfect tense. What does that mean? It means it's a past event. It means that it was done. It's a done deal. Past event with continual consequence. So something is done, but something is happening. Which means that being born of God is finished. God did it. God did the work. Finished. It's a past event. But this past event has a continual effect. It needs to keep going. It needs to keep moving in our life with the present belief. Can you say that I am born of God, I believe in Christ, and you walk out that door and you start punching people? No. Because that is not a life of continual believing. That is not a life of continual believing. Put it simply, which one comes first? Regeneration or salvation? Born again or faith? Or chicken or the egg? Egg? <laughs> of course chicken chicken why because according to genesis god made what animals okay god made animals first not the eggs and think about chicken chicken has to give way for the eggs chicken has to birth the eggs regeneration gives way for salvation being born again gives way for the continual faith allowing us to continually live and believe in Christ. So an important question is if we have been regenerated, born again, can we lose our salvation? Can we stop believing? It is impossible for a believer. It is impossible for a believer. We will persevere in faith. This will continually give us the evidence that we have been born again. When we have been born of him, we have been given faith that is permanent. It cannot be lost. There is no such thing as unbelieving believer. Okay? Unbelieving believer. Think about it this way. 
the author knows exactly the title of his books. Okay? If you met any author, if you read any books, you see a book and you see what? The author's name in the cover of the book, right? Author knows exactly the title of his books. Who is the author of faith? Who is the author of faith? He knows every single name that he has personally written in his book of life. It's been written with the ink of God. Revelation 3, 5. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Isn't that amazing? As long as you know the author of faith and he knows you, you will be the one who conquers. You will be an overcomer. Your name never being ever blot out from the book of life. Third and last nature of true Christian faith as an overcomer is knowing and living the spirit-filled effects of faith. Spirit-filled effects of faith. Christianity today is full of hypocrites. It's shallow as it can be. The world says, and even in the Christian church, people say that Christianity is thousand miles wide and one inch deep. So sad. What's the problem? What's the problem? People go to church, people read the Bible, people lift their hands in worship, people pray the sinner's prayer, people go to crusades and retreats and they go to Christian concerts, people have amazing spiritual or emotional experience, yet they think they have faith, their lives don't change. Their lives don't change. Look at verse 2. Can we read it together? Ready? Begin. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey His commandments. Okay, there we have it again. Love, right? If we say we love God but do not help others in the church, our faith is a fake. If we say we love God but our moral values, right, are no different than the world's. The lust, the things that we watch, the things that we say, it's no different than the world. Our belief is false. If we say we love God, but we're selfish, angry, not giving, not generous, our trust is in the wrong place. When you think about the gospel, when you think about faith, remember Jesus who died for you on the cross. We love God who is above, and we love his children who are to our right and to our left in the church and at our home. We love God and we love each other. This is living the spirit-filled effects of faith when we love and when we obey. It's a natural response from someone who has been loved unconditionally. Yet at the same time, it is supernatural because we cannot do it on our own, right? We cannot, but we can do it with the power of the Holy Spirit. Authentic discipleship true christian faith of an overcomer is not easy it is a narrow road it is hard but it will continually result in the spirit-filled lives of love and obedience i believe pastor phil johnson uh, gave this analogy i thought it was an amazing analogy you, may, you, you guys may have heard it football scholarship have you guys heard about that one this guy he got full ride you know to this greatest college the biggest college they gave him the dorm they gave him the money they gave him all the education they gave him the books and they gave him four year ride right and he got this free scholarship he got this money what is he gonna do afterwards he's gonna go to that school and Michael play football so he knows what is he gonna do he's gonna sweat right He's going to go into so much pain and he's going to live each day with that scholarship, with that free scholarship in his life. He's going to live each day just pouring with his life. He's going to give up everything so that the school receives the championship. We really cannot say we love God and others if we break God's commandments. We got to do what we're called to do as Christians. Love and obey. Love and obey. That's what we do. So, do we never fall? Do we never fail? No. 
No. This question came up during our Bible study. Do we never fall? Why do we fall? And why do we get tempted? God knows that we are not perfect. Verse 3. This is an amazing verse. Can we read it? For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. Did you catch that? His commandments are not burdensome. Our obedience will never save us. Our obedience will never save us. God knows that. It is simply a result of our faith in Him. It's simply receiving this free scholarship and saying, God, I am so grateful. I am so thankful. I'm going to live each day for you. Our gratitude for this amazing grace and love that we receive from Him. We have been given a new heart and new desire to obey and keep His commandments. We're living now as God's children, born of God, so we want to keep His commands. We want to obey His commands. Slavery to sin was very hollow, very hollow. Every time we sinned, we felt empty inside. Yet it was heavy. It was weighing down our conscience. Was it really fun and freeing to live in sin? How about now as believers? Aren't we truly free? Isn't the yoke of Christ, His commands, much gentler on our back than living in slavery of sin before you knew Christ, living in the life of sin, and now living in bondage to Christ, in yoke to Christ? Isn't that absolutely restful on our soul, radically liberating? Indeed, for us who are truly born again, we exactly know what that means. His commandments are not burdensome. Because, verse 4 through 5, last two verses of the day, let's read it. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is a victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? His commandments are not burdensome because we are an overcomer. We end today's message with the word we started with, an overcomer. Three forms of Greek words that we are very familiar with are used in these last two verses. Born of God overcomes, nika, the world. And this is the victory, nike, that has overcome, nike sasa, the world. Who is it that overcomes? Nikon, the world. The noun form of this verb is translated nike, nike. Can you think about a word in this world? Nike. Nike, very good, Christian. The Nike shoe company named themselves after the Greek goddess of victory, Athena Nike. Last two verses are great summary of the nature of true faith that we learned today. Who is the author of our faith? God. Since we have been born of God, what is the object of our faith? Jesus. We believe that Jesus is the Son of God. So who are we when we have this faith? We are an overcomer. God-given faith in God's Son is what makes us victorious over God's enemies. The loveless world, its ruler, the devil, its deceivers, demons, false teachers, unbelievers, and the Antichrist. Like Paul in Philippians 4.13, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. John was proclaiming, when we have true faith, we are an overcomer. This is what John is screaming to. This is like John's Philippians 4.13. When Paul was screaming, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. We have the victory. I can win. I can live this life with the love of Christ in me, with the love of God in me. I can do this. And John was proclaiming, we have the victory. We won. Church, this is a powerful truth that you must walk away with. Professor David Allen on this topic stated 30 years ago, Christians don't fight for victory. Christians don't fight for victory. We fight from victory. We fight from victory. Christ has already won the victory for us on Calvary. Martin Luther stated a lot earlier, 500 years ago, the devil, the flesh, and everything that is evil has been crushed, has been crushed by Christ. 
Apostle Paul stated much earlier in 1 Corinthians 15, 57, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Do you like sports? Yeah. I love sports. <laughs> that was the loudest amen I heard today. <laughs> if you know me a little bit, okay, you know how much I love the Dodgers. But you know I love Christ more, right? So there's a very important game going on right now, but I didn't check the score because it's all about Jesus. Amen? I love the Dodgers, okay? I love watching them win. It's shallow for me to say, but wife knows this very well. She knows if the Dodgers won or lost by looking at my face. When they lose, I get sad. <laughs> the mood of the house changes. When they win, I get happy. <laughs> what makes these baseball games or sports happy or sad is that you don't know the results. You don't know who's going to win. And when they do win, we don't know with how many points they will win. For the Dodgers, for those of you that are not Dodgers fans, it took them more than 32 years to win it all. Okay? My wife always made fun of me. She always used to say, oh, sports is not real. It's all set up. Right? But Dodgers, for them to win in 32 years being that good because they paid the most amount of salary. I think they paid more than, what, 200 million or billion or something, right? It's crazy how much they pay their players. But that's what makes the game so exciting because we don't know who's going to win. There were nights and days where my sons and I would just cry and put our tears down our face and we would go to sleep because they lost so bad. However, the game that God is playing, the battle that God is waging, is nothing we are to worry about. Do I need to cry my heart out like I did for the others? No. Romans 8.37 says, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Church, important thing to remember is that we don't just win in this spiritual battle. We don't just win in this life that we live. But we win with an overwhelming victory through him. It's like 4-0 in the series of seven games, playoff series, with double-digit leads in every single game, baseball or basketball or football. It's like sweeping a series. You take out the broom. That's what they say in sports terminology. There is no chance, no hope for the other team. Funny thing about fandom is when Dodgers won after 32 years, when they won that championship, did I get anything? No, absolutely not. They did not even give me a single grass from their field. I cried for them all those years. I wept for them. I even felt agony with them, but absolutely nothing. So sad. Yet how about when God wins? How about when God wins? Revelation 3.21 the one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Church, we really don't get much from this world, from the things that we like. Everything is passing away. But according to Revelation 3.21, when God wins, we get everything. We get everything. Faithful believers, authentic disciples, true Christians will get to share Christ's throne. We will reign victoriously with Him forever. There is no greater championship trophy. There is no greater reward than to share all of eternity with God and Christ on His throne. So LA1 Church, let your faith be in Christ who is our object of faith. Let your faith you have to understand that your faith only comes from God, our source of faith. We have been graciously been given this gift of faith, eternal life. So let true faith have its everlasting, spirit-filled effects of love and obedience. In your life today and always, when these natures of faith that we learn today are active in your spiritual life, you will indeed have your Nike. Nike. The biblical one, the one that does not rot, the one that does not rust, where moth 
and things destroy, the victory, the victory, Nike, that is forever. I think I've only had one or two Nike in my lifetime. They're a little too expensive for me. I've never owned them. Yet even these amazing, expensive Nike, you know, athletic shoes, even them, they fade, rot and rust. Because something like this is from the world. However, the biblical Nike, Nike, it's from above. It's in your soul. It's in your life. You have to know this, that you are an overcomer. You have to live it, that you are an overcomer. Chew on it, that God has given you this opportunity to live your life as an overcomer. Let us pray. Let's thank God that with all that is happening in the world, as Pastor Jason shared in Call to Worship, that our life may be in a really difficult situation. I know some of us are really going through tough times. Like my mom, you know, you guys know what happened to her yesterday, some of you. And I was so blessed to see her faith through this difficult time. I asked her this morning when she came, did you forgive the person? And she said, when I walked out today, I wrote a Bible verse in the wallet where she, they took the money. It was amazing because the wallet was hidden and the robber knew exactly where the wallet was. So he may come back. So she put a Bible verse in there and she said, believe in Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And she put a $20 in there. Wow. What a faith. What a faith. And the message that you heard right now is the message that she heard yesterday. As you guys know, I always preach the message in Korean before I come here. And she heard this message yesterday. And she wanted to live out her life, spiritual life in the effect of love and obedience and for her to live in the life of love and obedience for her to live a life as an overcomer though she lost yesterday physically and financially in the world she got all her gifts from korea taken away she got all her money taken away that she had in this one drawer and for her to live her life as an overcomer she wrote a bible verse and she wanted to evangelize to her mom Church, I want to challenge you and encourage you to pray right now. God, let me live a life of faith where I am not a loser, but I am an overcomer. Because Christ has won this battle for us and we don't fight for victory, but we fight from victory. Let us remember that, church. And let us fight each day. And let us fight for this faith that He has given us. Let's pray, church. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for allowing us to be a true overcomer in this world. We don't deserve any of this, but you gave us grace. You are the author of our faith, and you gave us this blessing to live each day recognizing that we fight from victory. That Christ, you have already won the victory for us on that Calvary. When you die and you pay the penalty for our sins so that we praise risen Lord. Who is living today? Who is giving us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ? So we recognize that we are more than conquerors. We are more than Nike. Through Him who loved us, we are an overcomer. So God, you have given us faith. And we're going to conquer this life that we live. And at the end, you're going to allow us to sit with you on that throne. Because you've conquered and we live in your victory. We thank you, God.